Now, I love, the, I love the sort of the insularity of Mr. Bean, this sort of self-centeredness which reflects in the fact that, you know, if I have to get myself into the part, I don't need another person or a situation or a prop in order to, to create him. You just have to, you know... <laughs> you know, it's just... It's, a ter it's all, all about him yes. and where he sits in the world. He's quite sort of... He's got a sort of an invisible shell around him. Yeah. He's hugely popular internationally, isn't he? Yes, it, it is bizarre, actually. The, it's, 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 it's something that I try not to think about very much, because actually if I ever do you know, stop and dwell on, on how well-known my face is in so many obscure yes. corners of the world, that, that, that I think I'm, I would find it rather disturbing. And Are I, you made aware of it when you go abroad? I'm being slightly disturbed about it, even talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yes, I'm aware. No, you hear ex extraordinary things about, you know, like a friend of mine making a documentary for Comic Relief and going into Africa, you know, into some of the most uh, deprived areas of Africa and going to this, you know, little African village where there's no water, no electricity, no services, no, no nothing, no food in all likelihood and, and just a few huts and in the largest hut the entire village was gathered and there was a grainy, <laughs> tiny black and white screen showing a Mr. Bean video. <laughs> What about, let's, let's uh, talk about the other great comic creation that, that, uh, that you made, and that was Edmund Bl Blackadder. Mm -hmm. um, what was the reason of setting it, first of all, in, in 500 years ago? I mean, what was the inspiration for that? Yeah, it was after a sketch show that I did called Not the Nine O'Clock News, um, and myself and Richard Curtis wanted to do a sitcom of some kind. And we were sitting around trying to think of ideas, and, and of course the dominant sitcom of the time was Faulty Towers, mm. and it still is, a very dominant sitcom, mm. and a definitive uh, piece of work. And, uh, mm. and I think we were fairly convinced that whatever we did, you know, no matter how hysterically funny it was, it would, it would be unfavorably compared, we thought, to Faulty Towers. And so we were desperate, and, and so I think some of the reason why we ended up, you know, 500 years ago was because we're thinking, well, surely if we set it in medieval <laughs> times, no one's going to say it's a pale imitation of Faulty Towers. <laughs> at least that was the hope. I'm sure somebody still did say it. So that's why the first series en en ended up at that time. And of course, uh, one always remembers, of course, that classic last episode, too, which seemed to define for me that that narrow gap there is between tragedy and comedy. Yeah. It yeah, was a very well, bold thing and very moving, and, and at the same time, it did have sort of comedy, comedic side to it. Well, I mean, there is, I mean, you know, it's like the current, you know, situation with war elsewhere. There's no doubt sometimes that the, the, the darker, the more serious the backdrop into which you set your comedy, you know, sometimes the brighter your little sparks of comedy are set out yes. in sharp relief against it. Yes. Um, and that series was full of that sort of stuff. Yes, it was, I'm, indeed. I mean, Richard and, and Ben's work was, was fantastic. And that last episode, which really did get quite sad uh, towards the end, was, I think, almost uh, deliberately conceived to to defend the series against criticism that we were making light of a very tragic situation, which was the situation in the trenches in northern France mm. in the First World mm. War. In fact, it turns out that that criticism never materialized, that people just accepted it for what it was yes, and, 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 and enjoyed it for what it was. It's a classic now. But, it was, um, but I remember filming when we, you know, the weeks uh, a rehearsal leading up to the one-day recording of that last episode, when we went over the top at the end. And for the first time, and probably last time, actually, in my acting career, that because throughout rehearsal, you know, as an actor playing the part of the Black Adder and knowing that even though the rest of the episode, of course, was, was its standard sort of funny sitcom self, there was this deep sort of twist in, the, you know, um, in my stomach throughout that week of sort of thinking along with your character that you were doomed, you know, that you were going to die mm. at the end of the week. Mm. It was the most peculiar, I'm sure, you know, Serious actors playing uh, serious characters in difficult situations feel this all the time. Mm. That you, you know, there's a psychological effect. And obviously, if you're trying to feel the character and feel his dilemma, then you're going to feel some of the fictional feelings for real. Mm. Uh, and I was amazed, you know, throughout this awful knot in my stomach. Was it difficult to do week. itself, the actual moment of doing it? Was it no, it was, no, you felt swept along by it. Yet yes. again, I think because it was so well written. And, the, and that weird, you know, transition when you go forward and I blow the whistle that, we, you know, we go over the top that you... And there's some wonderful lines about, you know, because I'd been trying to pretend that I'd gone mad in order to get sent back from the front and it conspicuously failed, you know, and the black adder says some... I can't remember it very well, but says some lying about, you know, who would notice another madman around here. You know, and a line like that, it just, you know, grasps the moment. And, it, and, it's, and it's, so, it's so fantastic to, to be part of. And, but it was, but by God, I felt it. Yeah, I really did feel it.